Welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. I'm sitting here with Pastor Ken, who just preached a great message in our Blessed series. And we have a few questions, so stick around to the end. But before that, let's listen to Pastor Ken preach now. So we're continuing on in this series, uh, like I said, studying the Beatitudes. What are the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes, that's just a big fancy word for blessing. And the Beatitudes are the eight statements that Jesus made at the very first of the Sermon on the Mount. That's in Matthew chapter 5. He's saying, if you want to get blessed, I'll tell you eight ways right here. If you want to be happy, not happy in a superficial kind of happy, but joyful in a way that is deep and abiding, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of of the things that are going on around. If you want that kind of joy, if you want that kind of blessing that nobody can take away from you, no matter what's going on, he says, I'll tell you these eight ways right now. Now, we said two weeks ago when I started this series, we said the first four of those Beatitudes have everything to do with how we step into the kingdom of heaven. Those four Beatitudes have everything to do with our entering into the kingdom and becoming a believer. Um, And I won't go back through those. Dan took us through the third and the fourth. I took us through the first and the second. Um, But then we get to the back four. The back four Beatitudes have everything to do with the radically altered mindset and outlook that a believer has. When you really have stepped onto Team Jesus, everything is different than it was before you had come to know him. And these four qualities will characterize you. And so that's a a little reminder of where we have been and and where we're going. Today, I want to take uh, one of those Beatitudes, but I'm not going to take it in sequence. I'm going to go a little out of sequence for a reason that I think will be clear by the time we're done. Our verse today is Matthew 5, 9, which says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God the daughters of God, Matthew 5, 9. One short verse. You're like, well, this is bound to be a real short sermon. Well, actually, (laughs) there's so much to say about this one verse, but I'll give it my best shot to to get through all of it in the time that I have. Three things I want to talk about if you're a note taker. The first one is this. What does that mean, a peacemaker? What does that mean? Second thing what does it take? What does it take to be a peacemaker? And then the third thing, why does it matter? Why does it matter? All right. So let's take the first one. What does it mean? Blessed are the peacemakers. Sometimes the best way, I think, to understand a term is to look at the opposite of what the term is and to work your way back from there to eliminate what it does not mean. The word peacemaker is often a misunderstood word. People mistakenly think that the way to make peace is by tiptoeing around the emotional eggshells at your workplace or at the school or in your home and just keep things peaceful, right? Just keep the marriage going. Uh, Don't rock the boat, sweep things under the rug, and don't make waves, and let sleeping dogs lie, and and that way everything can stay peaceful around here. Some of you are thinking, yeah, here's a beatitude I'm finally good at, all right? Peacemaker, right? No. What I just described is not a peacemaker. That's called a peacekeeper, Okay, if you're tiptoeing around trying to keep everybody happy, the word for that is not peacemaking, it's peacekeeping. When you're avoiding real problems, things that aren't fair, trying to appease other persons or people just to keep everybody happy and calm, counselors have a word for that. It's called codependency. You're not making peace if you're doing that. Peacekeeping. 
That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about peacemaking. Now, what is peacemaking by contrast? Peacemaking is doing whatever it takes to bring into the lives of others God's shalom. That's a big fancy Hebrew word that means all of God's completeness and his wholeness and his well-being. Shalom and peace, to bring that into other people's lives. That's what peacemaking is when we're bringing those things into other people's lives. One scholar put it this way. Peacemaking is doing whatever you can to grab hold of heaven and to pull it forward to the present for the sake of someone who has not currently experienced or is not currently experiencing the peace of God. That's what peacemaking is. That's what it means. Now, what does it take? Well... If you're any good at marriage, you know at least two things that it takes. It takes a lot of humility, and it takes a lot of sacrifice. But sometimes it's also going to take a third thing, an intermediary. That's somebody who will be in the middle who will help make the peace. Remember in the series that we did last fall where we were talking about Abraham and working through Abraham's life and we got to that time that we were talking about Lot, his nephew, and how Lot had just all but sold his soul uh, to the city of Sodom and he'd moved far away from God and he'd even moved physically inside the city gates and all. And, And so God is talking to Abraham and God says to Abraham, I'm going to have to destroy Sodom. They just go, it's just too far. I'm going to have to destroy Sodom. And at that point, Abraham calculating, wait, my nephew is there. What did he do? He interposed himself. He inserted himself in between Sodom and God. And he said, wait, 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 God, God, there's got to be a different way. What if, if I could find 50 righteous people, would you have mercy on Sodom? And God says, Yes. So Abraham says, well, in that case, if I found 45 people, or make it 40, make it 30, 20, how about 10? I mean, he, what's he doing? He was serving as the intermediary. He had interposed himself in between saying, isn't there some other way that peace could be made here? to accomplish what you have to accomplish. Again, you see a similar thing in the book of Esther. You remember the story of beautiful Esther and how she was there in Persia, literally laying her life on the line to save the Jews, to spare the Jews who were going to be wiped out by the wicked Haman. And so what did she do? She inserted or interposed herself. She became the intermediary between the king's wicked advisor, Haman, and the Jewish people, and she served as the peacemaker, bringing about their safety. Interposition is the biblical doctrine of stepping in between an unrighteous, typically unrighteous government and innocent victims in order to reflect God's standards. The greatest example of interposition is Jesus himself who interposed himself between a holy God and a fallen humanity. Of course, the story of our lives and our world begins at Genesis and it all opened in a garden full of peace. The story starts with peace And in Revelation, it ends in peace. But boy, there's no peace in between, or at least starting in chapter 3 of Genesis. That's when everything went haywire. That's when our spiritual parents shook their fist at God and said, even though you say, I want you to do that or not do that, we're going to do the opposite because we want to decide for ourselves. And the problem with Their fall is that even if it hadn't happened to them, I'm sure by the time we had come along, we'd have done the same thing because all of us like sheep have gone 
astray. All of us have shaken our fist at God and all of us therefore are dead in our sins and trespasses. And we would have no hope but God who is rich in mercy sent us a divine savior, his son, Jesus, who came to be our intermediary. He came to this earth living the life of sinless perfection that none of us could live and dying the death of punishment that all of us deserved and then conquering the grave on the third day that none of us could have conquered and declaring to us, now you have peace with God through me. He was the divine intermediary, the divine interposer, stepping in between. And sometimes peacemaking requires someone who will do that. So Jesus himself, Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.14, he is our peace. Peace is not something that Jesus intended for us just to receive passively and go merrily on our own way. No, no. Because he turns to us and says, now, now that I have made peace with you and what I have done has given you peace with the Father, I'm calling you to turn towards the rest of this fallen world and do the same. You're going to be my peacemakers. Who? Me? Yes. Every one of us. Remember, these qualities are the shining characteristics that you'll see bubbling out of someone who really is on Team Jesus, who really has stepped into the kingdom. Now, all of us, Tim Keller uh, points out, Reflexively, we go through our days uh, asking ourselves, if not aloud, thinking to ourselves, do I like this person? Does that person like me? What does this person think of me? And is that person worth any of my trouble? And is that person up to my level? But Keller points out that's a very old fashioned way. That's a very old way of thinking. It characterizes how we thought when we were not yet at peace with God. But now that you have been brought into peace with God, we're called to look at other people with a whole different set of questions, such as what is God doing in this person's life that I could help along? And where is God trying to bring peace into this person's life that I could help that peace come into their life? that I could be a peacemaker for them. I'll give you three examples of well-known peacemakers. The first one is Corey Tim Boom. Now, she might not be as well-known to you, uh, but Corey grew up in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and during the days of Hitler, she and her family, they just couldn't constrain themselves. They knew as followers of Jesus As Christians, we have to do something to bring God's shalom, God's peace to these suffering Jewish people who are being systematically exterminated. And so she became very active. Her family became very active in the Dutch underground. The resistance movement committed to interposing themselves between innocent Jewish people and the vicious Nazi regime. And through the years, they helped hundreds of Jewish people be protected, carefully hiding them, uh, for example, in their homes uh, where they would be spared of the Holocaust. What was happening? Corey and her family were working to bring God's peace. It was as if Corey and her family were trying to, to reach up to heaven and grab as much of God's peace as one hand could hold while wrapping their other hand around as many Jewish people as they could wrap their hand around to try to bring those together. She was a peacemaker. 
I'll give you another example. Billy Graham, the great evangelist who died last year. What did he spend his life doing? Well, the people who write his, his biography say, oh, well, he was a very handsome man, and uh, he had offers from Hollywood, and he probably could have gone off and made a career as an actor. And, <clears throat> and Or he also had dreams as a young man or a kid as of being an athlete, and he probably had the, the, the potential to, to do that, but that's not what he spent his life doing. He spent his life going from city to city and stadium to stadium, night after night, preaching and then reaching up to heaven to grab as much of God's grace as he could grab in one hand and reaching out into the stadium and grabbing as many of the people in the stadium as he could grab to bring them together so that the light of Christ, the gospel, the good news, the hope of Jesus could begin to shine forth in those people's lives who had come not knowing Christ and not walking with him and not having them in their lives. Billy Graham, you see, he was a peacemaker as well. I'll tell you one other one. Mother Teresa. You know her story. You remember her story, don't you? She was the poor nun, the little lady who lived over in India and was always drawn to the least and the last and the lowest and the poorest and the sickest of those who were in the Indian slums, the, the throwaways of society. What did she spend her life doing? She spent her life reaching up and grabbing as much of heaven's love as she could grab. And in the other hand, grabbing as many poor, sick, and dying people in India lying on the streets to bring them in and try to, to bring as much of heaven to bear, as much peace as she could bring into their lives, even if just in the final days of their lives so that they could die with love and dignity. Mother Teresa, she was a peacemaker as well. Each of these were grabbing as much of heaven as they could grab and as many of the people as they were serving and giving their lives to helping and trying to bring those together, which is exactly what Jesus did for us, right? What did he do? He reached up to the Father and he reached out to all of us and he brought together by his grace our salvation so that we might know peace with God. And incidentally, don't you find it interesting that the, the, the beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, what's the, the back part of the, the verse? What's the reward or what's the blessing? What's the consequence, the outcome? For they shall be called the sons of God. Who's that remind us of? The very son of God and the daughters of God. This is what Jesus is saying. If you're my follower, this is what we do on Team Jesus. We're about making peace because we're never more like him than when we're bringing his peace to bear in other lives. Now, let's move to the third thing. Why does this matter anyhow? Some of you are like, well, you know, that's rather interesting, I suppose, but, but why does it matter? I'll tell you why it matters. It matters because our world is hopelessly in need of godly peacemakers. Statistics that I read regularly are showing that in the church, in the American church I'm talking about, I'm not talking about other parts of the world, but in the American church, increasingly Christianity, the Christian church is being written off by skeptics. Why? Because the skeptics are looking at us at us as believers and saying, yeah, there's not really anything special about them. It is nothing really particularly authentic or genuine or real. It's, it's, uh, if anything, it seems a little superficial and phony. You know why this is, friends? Because many of us, we're not doing such a great job of being the peacemakers in our sordid, broken world that he created us to be. Too many a Christian's political uh, identities are trumping their, their identities in Jesus Christ. 
too many Christians are idolaters of politics. And the answers to life's questions have never been found in politics. Not 2,000 years ago in the days of Caesar. And not now in the days of Trump and Pelosi. Don't, now, don't misunderstand uh, what I'm saying here. I vote and I have political leanings, but those leanings must always be subjugated to my identity in Jesus Christ. We can't be people today taking our cues from the world around us. We just cannot be. The Bible calls that worldly, not godly. No, we who are on team Jesus, we are kingdom people. We take our cues from Jesus and from his word. And I'm telling you, if we could get this right, you know what would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. Revival would happen. Because throughout history, wherever real Christians lived the life of authenticity that he called us to live, revival breaks out. For example, it, well, think about it. Just go back to the very beginning. Jesus finishes his ministry on earth and we, we sort of forget how we ended up getting here. He didn't leave the Christian faith in big, beautiful European cathedrals or, no, no, all that stuff came along centuries. All he left behind were just several hundred people who had followed him. And they had nothing. They were poor by and large. And, and that's all he left behind and that's all he needed because those earliest believers, those first disciples, they took him seriously. And they got to a verse like this that said, blessed are the peacemakers. And they said, well, I guess we better go into the world and we better bring peace where there is no peace. And this, friends, is how Christianity exploded into the Mediterranean world. In just a matter of a century and two centuries, it had spread all around the Mediterranean just from a few hundred people. Why? Because it was so real. It was so earthy. It was so authentic. And for example, when the plagues were to hit and the people been running out of the cities because they're like, ah, I don't want to get the plague and die. Where were the Christians? The Christians were running into the cities. Running into the cities? Couldn't they get sick and die? Yes. And some would but they figured, hey, our calling while we're here on earth, we know where we're going eventually, but it's to pull as much of heaven forward as we can into the now. So we'll go and we'll serve these people and we'll minister to them and we'll share our faith so that they can have hope and know Jesus and come into peace with God themselves. And those sick and dying people said to the Christians, I don't know who you are or who you people are, but I'm telling you, I want in. That's what I've been looking for all my life. Sign me up. That, friends, is what happens when we who are followers of Jesus really become who we were called to be, the peacemakers, the people who are bringing God's peace to bear in other people's lives in this fallen world of ours. <clears throat> <clears throat> and if you look around the world, even today, in other parts of the world, not here in America, sadly, but in Africa, in parts of Asia, you see explosive growth that's happening, revival that's happening. Why? Because those believers are just living it out. They're not skimming along the surface and trying to sort of live in two worlds or two kingdoms at the same time. And other people are seeing their lives and saying, I want what you've got. I want to become part of whatever it is that you're a part of. It's Jesus. That's what I'm a part of. It's the Christian faith. That's who we are. That's why we have to be peacemakers, friends. That's why this matters, don't you see? 
as one great old preacher said, the reason that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers is because they're so absolutely unlike everybody else. Now, I've been thinking about another peacemaker, particularly in light of this weekend uh, and the holiday tomorrow for Martin Luther King. Talk about somebody who interposed himself between a land uh, that was governed by rules and laws that were ungodly and unbiblical and demeaning and evil. He interposed himself. He inserted himself as the intermediary between what was going on and a whole race of people who were suffering because of it. Now, I want to say something here to my brothers and sisters who are white, particularly if you're my age or maybe older. I bet that some of you have probably heard that Martin Luther King was a flawed man. And perhaps you've heard, well, he disqualified himself anyhow because he had an adultery issue. But you know, I was pondering that this week in my studying and in my praying, and the thought occurred to me, well, I guess that made him like King David. He too was an adulterer, but we don't just throw his whole life out. We spent a whole semester going through his life a few years ago, right? Why? Because yes, that was a bad scene. It was a terrible scene with Bathsheba and what came in the aftermath of that. But there were still so many things that were right about David and about what he stood for and what he lived and so many teachings that are valuable on that side of the ledger for us. And similarly, I think we do a great disservice to ourselves if we just say, well, Dr. King, well, you know, he just disqualified himself and No, his sinfulness notwithstanding, he brought very important lessons to our culture, to our society. His courage and his peacefulness, his heroic fight against racial injustice and oppression. It's very important. He was a peacemaker, Dr. King was. Unfortunately, many Christians with white skin have been on the wrong side of that battle. Many Christians with white skin were complicit back in the days of Jim Crow segregation, mistakenly thinking that they were peacemakers when really all they were doing was keep peacekeeping. Just let sleeping dogs lie. It's just not. That's what I'm afraid was going on. And many a church and many a pastor uh, were preaching a very tepid message. Now, I feel like I have a confession to make today. Although at Faithbridge, we've certainly uh, made reference here and there when texts take us to talking about uh, racism or slavery or these sorts of things. I've made statements about the evils of those. And I even came out and stood right here and made a statement a year or two ago when the Charlottesville, Virginia uh, calamity uh, happened, just saying so directly that we just cannot stand for that at all. It's evil and it's bad and it's wicked and so. But looking back, I went back through the records and realized I've never just come out and talked about the peacemaker that Dr. King was, particularly on a MLK weekend. And I've been asking myself, why have you not done that for all these years? And it was studying this beatitude that led me to the the understanding, I think, of why. I think I mistakenly thought I was peacemaking when in reality all I was doing is maybe peacekeeping for fear of of stepping on toes or offending somebody or tokenizing another person. And so I just, I, I just we know that we don't believe in it's bad, and, but let's just stay with the gospel. And, but I've been feeling convicted about that. And recently I was reading an article and the, and the author was saying, why don't you pause for a minute and imagine what it would feel like to be a young black male walking down a street 
or driving down a street and automatically considered suspect and potentially dangerous just because of the color of your skin. And I guess my pause to ponder that thought was just long enough for the Lord to insert into my mind a memory that I hadn't thought of in years. I suppose I repressed it for reasons you'll understand shortly. It's a memory that came from back in seventh grade. I went to the public uh, high school down in Houston called T.H. Rogers. And this was in the 70s after Jim Crow, but still integration was happening clumsily and some days better than others, I suppose. And, um, and one day I remember getting dressed uh, in the locker room for P.E. and putting on the gym suit and, and, and I liked getting out of there and just being first. So I, I got out and started over to the track or to the football field where coach had said to, to go. No sooner had I gone out the, the door that then there was these four guys, black guys, big, muscular. I'm just a thin, little scrawny seventh grader. And all of a sudden, they surround me before I even knew what was going on. And they're hollering out. And, and they, they gather around me in this tight little circle. And they're, they're bouncing me around. And I'm, I'm like this bowling pin that's, that's going around. And, and I felt really out of control. I'm like, what is going on? Now, to be certain, there's no punches, fluid, no, there's blood. There was no blood or any of that. But it was shocking and it was scary. And I didn't like that feeling. And it felt like it went on for about 15 minutes, but I'm sure it really only lasts about 15 seconds. And then when the flood of other boys came r rushing out the locker room, then they, the, those four just scampered off. And I remember sort of just like, whoa, what just happened there? And what did I do to deserve that? I'm thinking, and I was feeling uh, confused and um, like embarrassed and frustrated. And, and I remember just walking across the, the field to get over where he had told us to go. And right then, my friend Darnell walked up beside me. Darnell was a gentle soul and a black guy. And he walked up beside me. And as we walked along, he just softly said, I saw what they did to you. And that was wrong. And I'm sorry. And you know something just about those words just his willingness to come walk alongside me and just say those words, that really helped me to sort of move on. Proverbs 18.4 says, a person's words can be life-giving water. And it occurred to me as I was preparing for today, in all the years of faith bridge, in all of the varieties of people, which I love and we've always wanted and I want more of, I have never just stood here and walked up alongside any of my brothers and sisters of a different hue, and I guess I'm particularly thinking of black, but after the early service, I'm, I'm not, because a, an Asian lady came up and hugged me and said, thank you but I've never just walked up alongside you and said, I saw what they did. I read what they posted. I heard what they said. And that was not right. And I'm sorry. I don't know if those words can be helpful to you as they were when Darnell spoke them to me. But either way, I felt like God said it would be good for you to just say that. The problem of racism is still real. Um, and it is a problem. All of us, though, we have value, brothers and sisters regardless of what our color. Because all of us were created by God to be the temple of his Holy Spirit. 
And therefore, when somebody casts a racial slur, they're denigrating God's temple. Racism isn't first and foremost a skin problem. It's a sin problem. It's an attack from the devil, don't you see, on God and on the people that God has made. Loved ones of every color, don't ever insult God's creative nature. After all, a black person is just black and a white person is just white and an Arab is, is just Arab and a Persian is just Persian because the creator God made them that way. Nobody chose how they got to come out. So to disparage them based on how they look is to disparage the master artist in whose name we're called as saved ones to be peacemakers, not stirs up of the problems. And so where there's racism in a person, one thing and one thing is clear. And that is clearly, though you may say you're on team Jesus, though you may say you're part of the kingdom, I don't know if the gospel, the seed of the gospel has really gotten planted deeply enough into your soul because thoughts of racial superiority are impossible to any of us who have ever known the love of Jesus. Why? Because real believers know that all of us stand with the rest of humanity on the level ground that's found at the foot of the cross and the blood of Jesus is thicker even than the blood of your parents. That has to be our perspective. But to those of you of different hues, I am sorry. Sorry for even just my negligence in talking about it. And I have been growing and learning, and trying to understand what, I even have a friend, his name is Blake Wilson. He's a great pastor at Crossover Bible Fellowship. And he and I are on the same board of the Houston Church Planting Network. And a couple of years ago, I said, Blake, I really need to understand racism better. And could you help me? And he said, sure, ask me anything. And sometimes when he sees me coming, he's, he smiles. I think he knows because here he comes with some more questions. And I'm like, okay, you got to tell me. This thing that I saw on the news, this quote or this tweet, or you know what? How does that feel to you? How do you hear that through your black ears? Well, what do you think about that with your child? You, you're thinking child uh, feelings about your child and having fears about your children probably that I have never even thought I need to think about and worry about. And it's really helped me. And I'll tell you, it's a wonderful thing. And I would encourage you as believers seeking to learn how to be peacemakers, you'll do very well if you would find some person that you could just be real with and honest with and stick your neck out and ask the questions because we're called to be the peacemakers. Now, I know some of you right now, you're saying, well, I mean, Ken, you're, you, you talk to thousands of people, but I, I, don't, I don't have much influence. I don't know what much good I could do about this. Well, what can one person do? I guess that's the same question that could be asked to the one spark that was out in a dry forest of California. What can one little spark do? Well, we know how that turned out. If you'd be faithful with the little that you've been given, you might just be surprised at what God does. Because whatever earth divides, heaven seeks to unite, and he intends to use us, his believers, as the peacemakers, as the uniters. So I'll close with a, a good word picture that I heard Tony Evans use in a sermon. If you don't know Tony, he's an African-American preacher in Dallas. He's, Suzanne and I have loved to listen to him for years. And he said in this sermon that I heard some time ago, whenever I eat a sandwich, Tony said, I always put mayonnaise on it. Always mayonnaise. He said, because I'm not a mustard guy. He says, but you know, mayonnaise is interesting. 
He says, because fundamentally mayonnaise is only oil and water. But oil and water, they never get along together. Oh, you can try to force them together, but they'll never mix. They always will retreat back to their own sidelines. That's why they need an emulsifier. An emulsifier is something that reaches in two different directions at the same time and pulls together those things that wouldn't normally be brought together. And so Tony said, into mayonnaise, they put egg. And that emulsifying egg reaches out and grabs those water molecules. And that emulsifying egg reaches out and grabs those oil molecules. And that egg brings those two together and says, hey, whether you all were planning it or not, we are going to hook this thing up. And in the same way, the gospel of Jesus is about our emulsifying Savior, our Savior who reaches out to black people and reaches out to white people and reaches out to Hispanic people and reaches out to Asian people and all people and says, hey, I don't know whether you were playing on it or not, but my plans were that we were going to hook this whole thing up so that you could go into the world that is broken, that is shattered, that is hopeless, and that you could be my agents of peace making. That's who we're called to be. So why don't we pray together? God, thank you for a simple verse like this, one that I know I and probably many of us have read over but just never really pondered very much. And for all that you loaded into this verse. Thank you, God, for uh, um, the very inspiring uh, people, uh, several of whom we just got to talk about, who, who gave their lives to being peacemakers in this broken world. Lord, we would love to see a new thing happening in our nation we would love to see revival breaking out. But we know we can't mandate that. We know we can't vote that in. That's a spiritual thing that will absolutely, totally depend upon you working through us, but us giving you enough to work with that is authentic and real and genuine and transparent and contagious and transformational. My prayer, Lord, is that you would help us, give us grace, give us new eyes to see, to look at opportunities every day with the people we're interacting with and asking, how could I bring heaven to bear in this person's life? How could I bring, how could I be a peacemaker in their lives? And if you're here and you have never even said yes to Jesus and the peace he came to bring in the first place, then that's your first step. Even right now, you could just tell him, Jesus, I want you to sign me up. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to learn more about what it means to follow after you. I want to have the power of your Holy Spirit working inside of me and transforming me. I want you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness so that I can live the rest of my days for you and for your glory. Lord, won't you take us and won't you use us? Even this week, even this day, you show us a way that we can begin to put into practice these things that we might be blessed as peacemakers that you've called us to be. We pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at Faith Bridge, and I'm sitting here with Pastor Ken, who just preached a message called Blessed Are the Peacemakers in our Blessed series. Well, we have a few questions in, so I'll just jump in with this first one. Okay. It says, 
Pastor Ken, thank you for walking in obedience and speaking very honestly to those of, to those of us in the congregation that are white. I have many dead friends that are black, and I've always struggled with the fact that we as a church dance around and barely mention the issue of racism that plagues our world and our churches. Thank you for charging us to stick our necks out and do better, to be peacemakers and not peacekeepers. And the question that they have is, do you have any books uh, or, or articles you've read, sermons you've heard, or videos you've seen that you would recommend to those wanting to learn as you've been doing? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for your thanks. Um, and I'm glad that we're growing together. Mm -hmm. um, so with books, you know, John Perkins is a fascinating man. Uh, he, gosh, he's well into his 80s or 90 or so, African-American guy, and has a very powerful story that, um, well, it had to do with growing up in the South and things that happened to his family, and it, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very touching. But he's an old man now, and uh, but still talking and writing, and says he'll do it until he goes home to heaven. But his uh, book is um, One Blood, and that's John Perkins. Okay, One Blood. One Blood. And then another title that involves the same word, Blood Lines, mm -hmm. uh, and that's John Piper. Cool. And of course, Piper is, is a white uh, pastor. 60, I think he's between 65 and 70. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but very good a as well. Um, well, I suppose those are two good ones to start with. Cool. Uh, right off. Yeah, those would be two great books to, to get into it. Well, wonderful. Uh, well, we have one other question, kind of not on uh, the issue as race, just, as, just on the issue on uh, peacemaking. Peace and making. this person said, I'm finding it difficult to understand the line between showing grace and making peace with my non-believing coworkers and condoning their behavior. I know we shouldn't hold them to believers' standards because they aren't, but how do I respond uh, to how they behave without passively affirming it or conversely holding them to unfair standards? Mm, that's a great question. And it's a little bit hard to answer since we're not talking in person and I don't know the specifics right. of what you're asking. Um, but I think of um, a way of thinking that I believe Tim Keller uh, I, I picked up from. And he talks about... Um, there's really two extremes when it comes to coexisting with our unsaved friends mm -hmm. in the workplace and elsewhere. What do we do when we're with them and they're with us and, and we want to evangelize them, but maybe they're not coming as fast as we wish? And he says on one extreme, there is isolation, mm -hmm. and that has been the posture of some Christians. They, they isolate and say, we're just pulling out and we're not gonna get close uh, to you, why? Because you're sinful and you might contaminate us. Uh, but uh, that's probably not where we need to land. And then on the other extreme, uh, you have uh, what's called uh, assimilation, mm -hmm. where now you're, you're not distinct anymore. Mm -hmm. You're being drawn in and swept in with whatever ways of the world your friends are doing. And that's not going to make for a compelling witness either. And, and, and so Keller drives towards this word in the middle that I think is so strong, infiltration. Okay. Keep in mind, we're not called to isolate, not as believers. We're not called to assimilate, not as believers. We're called to infiltrate. Right. Now, without the specifics, I don't know how to say, and therefore, what if you tried this? Because I don't know what we're talking about. But, but maybe uh, just that word could be a, a guiding thought mm -hmm. um, as you ponder uh what it is that your friends are beckoning you to join them in and, and how far is too far and how, how right. much should you acquiesce or not. And uh, I think in most situations, at least in my own journey, it, it, you have to sort of figure this out on a, on a case by case, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, basis. 
I'm in a relationship with a uh, with one person who's who I cross paths with somewhat regular regularly, and he just has the foulest mouth and he's got the wildest sexual lifestyle and he loves to 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 talk about it. And so what I have felt like the Lord has said uh, thus far mm -hmm. is he's young. He could be my son. And he's just trying to figure it out. Let him just run at the mouth. Don't go in and, and rebuke him and say, would you please not say those things or describe those things. Uh, I let him run at the mouth. But then I always try to bring it back around, uh, at which point I'll say, and what are you thinking about God these days? And, right. and where, where is God in, in that? And Because um, he knows what I do. Right. And didn't know that he did, but now I know that he does. <laughs> and, um, you know, because I, I think he's a great kid. And, and I would love to see him uh, come to know the Lord, as I would everybody. Um, so in that situation, that's how I'm seeking to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. And it takes time. I, right. I forget which author uh, said it, but, but it was a, a remark to this effect. For those of us who grew up, uh, well, I was in the 70s and 80s, and um, many times evangelism was taught to us as a quick thing. We'll go out onto the beach, we'll share four spiritual laws, We'll get them converted. We'll do this deal in 30 minutes. Bam. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there is so much skepticism and there's so much uh, emotional, uh, personal, physical baggage that people are bringing. Evangelism is a much slower process. Mm -hmm. And so bringing the peace of, of Christ into somebody's life is going to be a journey. Right. I think this author in particular said... Uh, count on five years. Mm. And I remember somehow I felt liberated by that mm. because sometimes I suppose I had thought, I should probably already have closed this deal and, and, and be on to somebody else, but not that you can't be helping other people at, at the same time. But anyhow, right. uh, maybe patience as well. Yeah, that is good. And it's so important to realize that it is case by case, that there is no like direct answer, That's right. um, which is always a good reason for community and having this biblical being in your uh, small group, voices being in, your in there group. that can help speak into what if you try this, what do you try that? Because yeah. each, each case is different. Because there's wisdom in the counsel of many. And Amen. so sign up and get in your grow group. <laughs> yeah, Wonderful. Uh, well, Pastor Ken, thank you for a great message and a timely message as well. I know um, it was good for me to hear, and I'm sure it was great for a lot of other people as well. And thank you for joining us at Postscript. Uh, we'll see you back again next week as we continue the Blessed series. See you then. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.